the circle makes history with the lawyers and launching something that never happened before. For the first time ever, in fact, an ambitious report calls for EU legislation to ensure government workers in global supply chains are paid a living wage. I want you all to challenge for one minute the perception of fashion, something that some may dismiss as a frivolous sector. But when you think that we get dressed every single day, it is easy to realize that the fashion industry as an encompassing industry from agriculture to communication to today, legal is one of the most polluting industry in the world, but also sadly, one of the biggest employer of slave labor. And what you start to realize very soon is also how difficult it is to establish technically the slave labor part. Because when you are not in a recognized like bonded labor, for example, or traffic labor, but you are instead nevertheless stuck in a cycle of never ending poverty as you are paid wages close to $50 a month sometimes, or even less, what do you do? It is a very sad truth <laughs> that the statutory minimum wage in the largest garment producing countries, in fact, comes nowhere close to a living wage. With most countries providing for minimum wage levels at less than 50% of what is necessary to provide for a basic decent life. And all of this with a weak regulatory environment in garment producing countries, which means that even the limited relevant labor laws and regulation often remain unforced. And the companies and the brands producing profit from this system, which is in fact for them very sustainable. So in 2016, a group of courageous lawyers, part of the Circle NGO, rolled, rolled up their sleeves and started to work with other lawyers in 14 production countries, part of Thomson Reuters Trust Law Organization and with the Clean Clothes Campaign. And as a, re as a result, in 2017, they managed to establish for the first time in history since the Treaty of Versailles, as Jessica Seymour will tell you, the legality of a living wage as a fundamental human right. And that report called Fashion Focus, the Fundamental Right to a Living Wage, was launched at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit that year. But the lawyers didn't stop there. Because when you challenge lawyers, as you all know very, very well, it's very difficult to stop them. So two years later, in 2019, Fashion Focus Towards a Legal Framework for a Living Wage was a report that presented an in-depth legal analysis of EU precedents that support living wage legislation. And from this, they developed an initial proposal for a living wage regulatory structure, of which you will hear all about it today. So now I leave the scene to the fabulous Lucy Siegel, broadcaster, journalist, writer, founding member of the circle, overall relentless campaigner for a more ethical and sustainable fashion, it's been for more than a decade, who was there at the very, very beginning of this project. In fact, she was the one who launched the first, the very first seed. And today we'll moderate what promises to be a very interesting and sometimes challenging discussion. So thank you for being here. And Lucy, over to you. Thanks, Livia. Um, I feel really emotional about today because as Livia points out, we've, well, Livia and I have been working together a long, long time. So just a very quick bit of background. When I first started writing about um, garments, um, factories specifically, I was really following on the work of Neil Carney, the trade unionist and um, Doug Miller. And we were looking very spe specifically about problems in the factory um, and a sort of warped supply chain. And the idea was that this was an accident waiting to happen. And then indeed the accidents did happen. I mean, they've been happening for a while. So we had the Spectrum disaster where 64 people were killed in about 2005. And everyone said this could never happen again and then of course we had Rana Plaza um, at which point the industry was still saying very much you know that we are we're not a dangerous industry but the way that we're framing this now is that we know this is a risk-filled supply chain as um, it is with electronics and food as well. Um, and uh, Jessica Simon's work is just kind of astounding because for years and years, Livia and I have been told 
by brands and retailers. There's nothing they can do or they're doing everything they can. Um, and we knew that once we got the, we, we started to get you guys to look at this through a legal lens, that it would be a game changer. I possibly hadn't believed how much. So I'll introduce you to Jessica in a moment, who will then present the proposal. Um, after that, we're going to hear from four uh, incredible speakers, all with a slightly different part of that legal lens, who are going to react to the proposal and the report. And then we're going to open up to questions, which you can put in time on a Zoom tradition in the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, but please, as soon as you have a question, just type it in so that we're ready to start asking them at 11 o'clock um, on the dot. Um, so we really wanted to start today off hearing from um, Bangladesh, which is obviously a very, very significant garment producing country. And we're starting where the report starts, actually looking at the industry after COVID, which is pretty much uh, I don't know, a snapshot of what we knew was going to happen if you pay people poverty wages and wage theft is endemic. Um, so we um, wanted to talk to Kalpana Akta, who um, was herself a, a, a child labourer labor in the fashion industry. She started working in, in garment factories at the age of 12. Um, she is now the executive director of the Bangladesh Centre for Worker Solidarity and the uh, Bangladesh Garment and Industrial Workers Federation. She always makes time to talk to us to Livia and I and she always has um, throughout um, our work. Um, we didn't know if we'd be able to get her um, today so we pre-recorded um, this brief interview, it's about six minutes long. Um, she may be able to hop onto this chat later so if you do have questions for her it's worth typing them into the box just in case Kalponet does join us. Um, uh, uh, so I started by asking her when we pre-recorded this, if she could give us a snapshot of life for garment workers on the ground during a pandemic. And Zoe, if you would be able to play in the video, that'd be great. So where we are now, you know, the pandemic is still here. So the industry kind of is in a steady position, but not improved. Um, as as you have read through the newspaper or many other channel that uh, the workers was constantly losing their jobs. So it is over 300,000 workers who lost job during this pandemic. And these are majority of them are like young women workers who lost jobs. So the workers who started know what is the economic freedom is or what is the, or, you know, empowerment is will be knowing they just went back to ground zero so this is the first situation and now the industry is not doing a uh, you know much more hiring so it is very slow hiring which is mean the workers who lost their job they couldn't come back uh, not all of them this might be few of them or one percent of them had just came back and got a job so rest of the workers they still fighting to find a job in this sector or any other sectors. The possibility is so minimum. I approached few of the women workers and men when I was in the field and I saw that, you know, in the factory gate, it is like over 200 workers. They're waiting for, you know, to get hired while the factory hiring one or two. So that tells that how difficult is the situation one woman particularly I spoke and she said she lost her job 10 months ago and she's struggling to get a job within 10 months and she couldn't. She has two children at home and her husband lost job when I met her a few weeks back. And in that particular day, she left her two kids, one six years old, one three, uh, without food at home and without, you know, anyone there to look after their children her children. So situation basically dire. Uh, and we really don't know when uh, this will be, uh, you know, over because our industry is so dependent on the West. If, uh, you know, the retailers are not selling their clothes, they might have an excuse to say that, oh, you know, we are not selling, so we cannot give you order. So the workers don't have job. That is the end of the day, what we can say. What does all of this tell us about living wage and the need now for 
this to happen? You know, the living voice uh, is very, uh, um, it is very important element for a workers. The, the, in the, you know, the industry or whatever industry we are talking about, it creates jobs. But you know, the jobs would be never a dignified job if workers would not have their living voice. So like in BCWS, our title, what our slogan is, uh, we are fighting for a dignified job. And dignity doesn't come until you have a living wage. I would be not going to the factory if my mom would get a living wage. If she would get a living wage, then I can go to school rather than ending my life to the factory. I started working 12. So there are many workers even today, like the women who left her two children at home. She couldn't do any savings because her wage is not enough for her monthly living, right? So if she would be having a living wage, she could make a savings and this difficult time, she can run with that money. So living wage is very essential for the workers, not only for their dignity, also, you know, uh, to have a shield for them to, uh, during the difficult times that we have now. So living wage definitely important and it is a high time for the retailers to contribute with uh, manufacturers and ensure a living wage for workers. Um, it's it's always it it always really strikes me that of course, as you said, you you started out as a garment worker, so you know exactly how it feels to feel trapped and to have your wages. They're not just falling below a certain level; it's wage theft, isn't it? Absolutely. Do garment workers, the women that you, that you're that you're referring to, um, coming out of this crisis? Well, I suppose it's an ongoing crisis for them. How do they connect to the idea in living wage? Do they believe in it, and do they do you think that they believe that it will be resolved? You know, um, I know for many workers, uh, it is a dream that one day they will get a living wage. But many workers, they are struggling and fighting, raise their voice in their factory. They are fighting in the street and they are reaching out every single places, uh, you know, stranding their voices in order to get a living wage. For them, yes, they believe that uh, it is possible, but it will only if the retailers and manufacturers and the governments, they change their mind. They change their mind from a minimum wage to a living wage. A minimum wage doesn't help workers. Uh, you know, it, it, it creates jobs for them, but it still keep them in a disturbing situation. A living wage only can give them a good livelihood. Workers do believe that, you know, uh, they can fight for it and one day they will win this fight. Okay, thank you so much, Kalpona. Um, I think Kalpona is with us, so please remember if you've got questions to put them in the Q&A box and just flag who they're for. Um, now, when uh, Livia and I and the rest of us were told that there was no opportunity for living wage and um, it wasn't gonna happen by brands and retailers, they obviously haven't figured on Jessica Simor QC, who is, is kind of small in stature, but a titan of human rights legislation. Um, so just, um, just a, a quick run through her work um, on this. Um, with the lawyer's circle. So report one, she established that living wage was a fundamental human right recognized since at least 1919, as Livia said. In report two, she basically closed in on precedents for regulation by the European Union beyond its borders. And now with this, um, with this third report, Fashion Focus, a proposal for new EU legislation on a living wage, this for me is the destination. Just one thing, in that first report, when she took the evidence from those 14 countries, she found no one was paying a living wage and garment workers were, were receiving between 6% and 57%, that was a sole outlier of a living wage. They were entrenched in poverty. Okay, now she will tell us how she's gonna upend the race to the bottom. Jessica, over to you. Lucy, thank you. Thank you very much. The first thing I should say, you're very kind, but this has been very much 
uh, an effort off the circle and the lawyer's circle, um, not a, a personal effort by, by myself alone in any sense. So I'm going to um, start with the objective of the proposal, its purpose, and then I'm just going to take you through some of the legal provisions. So the proposal is intended to tackle a market failure, the mobility of demand, which is enabled uh, by the excess of supply in the garment and footwear sector and the nature of the industry. Now, whilst the problem of poverty wages isn't confined to the garment and footwear industry, this industry is particularly affected and it's a scandal that has affected, uh, existed for many decades and worsened with the growth of fast fashion. In this industry, labor, female labor, is treated as if it were a commodity. The purchaser moving from one country to another in search of the cheapest source. This market behavior ignores a most basic principle that labor is not a commodity like any other. It's not water or timber. It's the means by which human beings should be able to achieve a decent life and improve their prospects and that of their dependents. The economy has no purpose of its own. Its purpose is to improve the well-being of human beings. And the core of this is that the minimum wage any worker should receive is one sufficient to sustain a basic decent life. This was explicitly recognized, as we've heard, in Versailles in 1919 and has been repeatedly stated in numerous international agreements and recommendations. But the basic idea that no one should be paid so little that they cannot sustain themselves and their family is deeply rooted in international human rights law, which is founded on and recognizes the inherent dignity of every human being. The problem with mobility of demand for labor in this sector and the high availability of labor creates a disincentive for garment producing countries to increase their statutory minimum wages. The risk of doing so is that they lose contracts and investments to other countries with cheaper uh, wages. And in turn, factories only pay the statutory min minimum wage. And retailers say that as a result, they can do no more that ensure, than ensure that those poverty wages are paid. So the object of this proposal is to reverse that race to the bottom to create an incentive for garment and footwear producing countries to increase their statutory minimum wage and to induce factories to pay more to their workers, so creating a more level playing field for fashion companies and helping those companies to ensure that our clothes are made by women paid sufficiently. So I'm now going to take you to the detail of the proposal. I'm going to try and share this document. Uh, I actually want to start on um, page 12, where we have, um, and I hope you can all see that, can you? Um, I'll shrink it slightly. So there is a summary of the proposal, uh, which sets out the steps, but the heart of the idea is that the commission, possibly in conjunction with the ILO, shall work out for main garment and footwear producing countries, the minimum wage necessary to sustain a basic decent life. Uh, and that will be by reference to local country conditions. And that point will be called the wage risk point. Um, sorry, sorry, Jessica, we can't see this. We can't see it on the screen yet. You can't see it? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I've obviously failed to share it. Hold on, let me. You did it really beautifully before, so... Uh, let me try again, share screen. Here we are. Yeah, that's up. Okay, good. So you've got there a sort of summary of um, the whole proposal, but I'm actually gonna take you now to the specific provisions. So obviously don't try and read this, you can read it later, but um, the, the idea is that if the statutory minimum wage in the relevant country is below the wage risk point that's been set by the commission, the country will be listed on uh, the annex to the regulation. And you'll see that in article 3.3. 3. 
Similarly, if the country does not guarantee collective bargaining, the country will also be listed on the annex, and you'll see that in Article 4. And the consequence of being listed in the annex is that the regulation applies to importers that use those countries for production. There'll be a three-year transition period enabling states to raise their minimum wage to a wage above the risk point, and you see that in Article 3.5. And Article 1.1 is the provision which shows that if your country, if the country is listed in the annex, then importers that use that country for production or buy goods from that country um, will be bound by the provisions in this regulation. The annex will be subject to annual consideration such that countries, by ensuring a minimum wage above the wage risk point and the right to collective bargaining, can be removed from the annex so that the regulation would no longer apply to imports from them. And you see that in Article 3.3. This would create an incentive uh, for countries to raise their statutory minimum wage since uh, producers would be likely to prefer to use countries that were not listed in the annex because that would get rid of the risk of sanctions. Now, the due diligence obligations that exist under this proposal apply first at the point of import. At this point, there's a requirement that the importer declare on the import form that it has taken all reasonable steps to ensure that the workers who made the goods were paid more than the wage risk point and that collective bargaining rights were guaranteed. And you find that in Article 5a. If the importer is not the trader, but somebody else, then the importer must obtain an undertaking from the trader uh, that all reasonable steps have been taken to ensure uh, that wages above the wage risk point are paid. There are then additional due diligence obligations set out in Article 7, which apply the OECD requirements in relation to the garment sector. Crucially, the trader must itself assess whether a living wage is paid to the workers who made the goods. It must, as a minimum, be above the wage risk point, but that will not be enough. There will be a requirement that the trader has actively engaged in the question of considering what a living wage is and also of enabling and ensuring collective bargaining. This is to ensure that the wage risk point does not become a minimum wage, but only acts as an absolute floor, i.e. it's a floor, not a ceiling. In relation to the due diligence obligations, Articles 6 and 8 provide for transparency and reporting obligations. Finally, Chapter 3 uh, provides for competent member state authorities, ex post market surveillance, uh, cooperation and checks between member state authorities and enforcement bodies. And Article 15 provides for rules me in relation to infringements um, and penalties are set out in article 16 uh, and this is crucial article 16 provides for financial ben penalties cross-border information and crucially at 16 3 to 6 minimal minimum level fines and the possibility of criminal penalties. Fines shall be paid into a central fund provided for in Article 17, and this fund shall be used to improve labour conditions in garment and footwear producing countries, where it is possible to compensate the workers, that shall also be done. So that, I can stop my, if I can stop my sharing, um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. Here we are. Stop share. So that is a, a fast run through the legal provisions. I hope it wasn't too fast. You'll obviously find it in the back of the uh, proposal. 
Um, and I hope we can discuss the, the idea a bit more in detail. Jessica, thank you so much. We've already got a few questions, but keep putting them in the Q&A, please, if you don't mind. And um, also on the chat box, um, uh, Jackie Engel has put up the, the list, the uh, link to the report as well, because, yeah, that text is quite small. Um, OK, um, let's move on now. We're going to hear from Professor Martin Scheltemer uh, from Pels Reichen and Drew Gleaver. He's also chair of the CSR committee at the International Bar Association and a professor of private law at Erasmus University and has lots of experience around garment and textiles disputes. Martin, you're very welcome. I'm gonna hand over to you um, now to get your response. Well, thank you, Lucy. And it's an honor to be in this, uh, in this panel. Um, I would like to start uh, by congratulating uh, the circle with this uh, great achievement because I think the legislative uh, proposal is, is very important, not only to create a level playing field, but I think also because living wage is often an enabler for other enjoyment of other human rights and workers' rights. So I think probably tackling many of these problems starts with um, enabling living wage. And of course, it's a very rich proposal and it's kind of not impossible to comment on that in full in five minutes. So I will limit myself to, to brief, three brief uh, observations. Uh, the first one is, I think, that as with all legislation, but also very important, I think, in this field, is that the legislation leads to impact on the ground and not only to administrative ticking the box exercises and administrative burdens, because sometimes legislation tends to do that instead of achieving impact on the ground. So I think it's very important that legislation also not only include all kinds of relevant measures, according, uh, amongst others, on due diligence, but also a thorough public uh, supervision. And I think there the public supervision is quite important because we have seen, for example, from the timber regulation that many member states, especially also in relation to criminal sanctions, really have different approaches to criminal enforcement. Some of them kind of hardly enforce and others try to really do that. So for creating a level playing field, it is very important that we have kind of comparable approaches and stringent approaches, which also focus on the impact on the ground and not only on the administrative uh, kind of ticking the box uh, functions of the law. Um, that's the first observation. So I think public enforcement is, an, and the format and the shape of, of public enforcement is, is very important. Um, the next thing I think would be in, in Article 7, which is really important in terms of the human rights or the living wage due diligence, uh, which has to be done in, in supply chains. I think there it's important to emphasize that that due diligence should include all six steps of the OECD due diligence, which includes uh, access to remedy and credible and effective grievance mechanisms on the ground uh, where workers can complain if they feel that things are uh, not be well in terms of, well, for example, living wages. Because what we often see is that sometimes in a factory, while well, living wage is um, applied, but then by using all kinds of subcontractors or others or all kind, of, all kind of informal work relationships, living wage can still be evaded. So it is important to also have local mechanisms where people can complain. And I think there, well, we see some mechanisms, but the effectiveness of them uh, is not always very good. So I think that's a thing to include. And the last thing would be um, the third observation, of course, the EU, and that's also acknowledged in the report, is uh, considering legislation on human rights due diligence in general. And the question is whether this type of legislation will be uh, kind of um, adopted next to the general proposal, or whether it would be a better um, um, well, manner or way to explore whether this can be kind of included or embedded in the more general the due diligence from, from the European Commission. And maybe then, well, the adoption of this proposal will be kind of easier and, and, and facilitated. So that may be a thing to, to um, think about. Um, thank you very much. I will stop there because I'm already, I think, <laughs> truly five minutes. Uh, thank you. 
Martin, thank you. And thank you for sticking to time so well. I'm sure we'll get some questions so we can come back to you. And if you have a question, please put it in the um, Q&A box. Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Miriam Zagamas, who is Vice Legal Director and Head of Business and Human Rights Programme, European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights. Miriam, thank you so much um, for joining us. I always follow your Twitter really avidly, so it's um, a great thrill to have you here, and I'm going to hand over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, also, thank you for uh, the honour to be invited to this uh, great panel. Um, and um, congratulations to this really great initiative. I'm, I'm very inspired and impressed by your work. Um, I also, yes, I want to be brief and I want to, I think I have three remarks, uh, one on the regulatory level and then two on, on the implementation level. Um, I think that this initiative uh, that you've been forward is very important and is complementary to existing human rights or to other human rights and environmental due diligence um, legislative uh, proposals. Um, as you know, uh, there is the French law uh, de vigilance um, in place uh, since 2017 that we've now seen the first cases there that are dealing more generally um, with human rights due diligence obligations. Um, and therefore potentially um, also, all the international human rights norms uh, indicating towards a living wage, you know, could be, you know, framed under this law, but so far there have been no, no cases to my knowledge brought under this law. And again, it's uh, as the French law is very broad in scope in the terms of which human rights you can claim, I think it would be very helpful to have a more specific regulation on, on specifically living wage, especially also as I also believe that living wage is a topic that can bring about also very needed and very systemic change. Um, at the German level, there's currently in Parliament on uh, next week, there will be the first hearing of the legislative proposal of the German government on introducing um, a, a so-called supply chain law, which also introduces human rights due diligence obligations and environmental due diligence obligations to German companies. In, in that, this law is more specific in terms of as it outlines which human rights norms need to be respected. And it specifically also taught, refers to the obligation to pay an adequate wage. So that companies, German companies need to have a human rights due diligence obligations to ensure and to work towards the payment of adequate wage. But then at the same time, and I think this has been really the work of the business lobby and the Minister of Economics, it's referring to the national level. And there we come again with the problem that if an adequate wage under on the national level is being looked at, then you know it's really not, not an improvement. So this is why I think this initiative um, is very important. And I would hope that, um, yeah, it does give also, as uh, been said before, you know, we are also having the human rights due diligence um, process at the EU level. Still, I would see, I would see a complementary role in this. Um, I think uh, what is true for uh, on the implementation level, I think what is the challenge for all of these regulations, which I'm absolutely in favor of, but I think what a challenge that we need to be aware of is how do we verify that the compliance, no? And I think you're referring to certification, which obviously is a mechanism that is sort of will need to be somewhat in place, but you know we know all the pitfalls that can come with certification. And how do we ensure that certification is independent, that is really well done, it's not, you know, it's not prone to bribery and, and so on and so on. I think that's something we need to be, uh, we need to keep in mind. And then the same goes also, and I like that you are putting um, a, um, a member state authority into ensuring compliance. I think that is also very important. And it, it, the risk is, you know, that this uh, also then assuring compliance later, it, if it's put on a uh, private body, you know, that would be, in my opinion, you know, quite dangerous. What I would hope what happens with such a re regulation is that it encourages um, workers-driven initiatives, and I think this is also why the referral to collective bargaining and freedom of association is really important, because I think what these uh, European legislations can do is they can sort of shift the power balance more towards workers and unions and workers organizations so that they can drive brands 
and retailers into those um, um, uh, you know workers binding legal legally binding wage agreements no and I think that must be sort of and the, the question is where does leverage come from why should brands enter into these agreements um, and I think if they are you know if there's sort of this regulatory pressure on them I think that's really where I see also the chance for systemic change and then if you have those independent legally binding wage agreements you know, I think a lot of the question of how do you verify that wages paid and so on can be solved and you, you know, the importance of certification becomes less, I think, because then you would have the three, three sort of tripartite um, uh, agreements and, and um, yeah, and then therefore also, you know, enforcement mechanisms, complaint mechanisms and so on and so on. I would see that a great ch chance of this. But um, yeah, I think those are my three points. Thank you so much. Well, they're very good ones. Thank you. That gives us a lot to think about. Please keep questions coming. Um, we're now going to hear from um, Thulsi, uh, Thulsi Narayan Asami, who is a senior labour rights researcher at the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. Um, Thulsi, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, especially from Australia. You're always able to synthesise um, uh, all of this um, campaigning and activism into like really crunchy points, which I always find so useful for talking to consumers as well. So I'm going to hand over to you and I'm just fascinated to hear um, what you make of the report. Thank you so much, Lucy, and, and hello to everyone that's joining today from Sydney. It's very warm over here. Um, it's I, I'm really thrilled that this report has come about and the huge amount of work that has gone into this because for those of us that spend a lot of our time thinking and working on these issues and trying desperately to improve the, the lives um, and of, of workers in this industry, we spend a huge amount of time thinking about and documenting the impacts, the hugely negative impacts of the non-payment of living wages. And we have very little headspace to think about constructively, how do we how do we deal with this? What is the pathway for us to be able to hold brands to account and ensure that wages are paid? And, and wages really have been the one issue at the root of the fashion industry that have evaded any kind of regulation for a huge period of time. You know, the, the, the business model of the fashion industry was initially presented as the pathway with which a huge number of women were going to be drawn out of, of poverty, women mainly in the global south. And instead, what we've seen is that it's an industry that's defined both by a huge structural imbalance of power between the brands, their suppliers and their workers, but also by exploitative wages. And I think what's really important to kind of bear in mind is that it's not an industry that inadvertently exploits workers with, with low wages. This is an industry that deliberately creates, sustains and relies upon low wages. And we see that in a myriad of ways, which I won't go into now because of time. But to give you an example, you know, it's it's H&M going to Ethiopia and producing clothes there because they can pay workers 12 cents an hour or twenty five dollars a month. It's it's huge fashion brands producing in countries like the UK and the US with those workers paid a fraction of the minimum, the legal minimum wage level, because their purchasing practices, the amounts that they pay to their suppliers simply isn't enough for them to be able to sustain um, meeting their, their legal obligations. So the reason why this particular proposal is so critical and for legislation that that specifically talks about a sector like, like, the gar like garments and also an issue just like living wages is critically important is because with this movement towards human rights due diligence legislation, which the other panelists have already mentioned, there is a real fear for many of us that they will think about human rights due diligence and look at the pointy end of labor exploitation, consider the drivers of forced labor and modern slavery and not think about the more structural drivers of things like minimum wage non-payment. So really, in a lot of the conversations that, that we have had at the Business and Human Rights Center with brands, there is a sense that things need to happen at an industry level. But, but at the same time, there are also kind of arguments that are being made to brands to say, you can meet your human rights due diligence obligations without needing to fundamentally change your business model or needing to affect your profit margin. And the reason I'm really excited about the idea of a regulatory 
approach at an EU level to living wages is because we're effectively now saying, yes, you will have to pay more to your suppliers. If states raise their minimum wage level, you will have to then in turn also raise the amount that you're paying to your suppliers. And, and from my position, that's the thing that's always been quite difficult to, to make happen. So I won't probably, I, I, I haven't even looked at the time and I'm very scared of going over time because I, I always do that. But I think I will just stop there um, and, and leave more to kind of come um, in questions. But but I guess my, my key point really is that it's it's important to note that this is this is the start point. Any any kind of, of legislation or regulation is, is not going to be a silver bullet. There will need to be a number of different pathways in order to effectively hold brands against a barrel and say you're going to have to cough up more in order to be able to not be sustaining your enormous profits on the lives of exploitation of female workers. Thanks. Thanks, Elsie. Well said. And thank you all for being so generous about keeping your comments so tight because it gives us loads of time for questions and we've got some really good ones coming in. I'm now going to hand over to Catherine Beck, who is Head of Legal at Trust Law. And I know um, it, it's just been so um, important um, for for for, um, for all of this work. Um, uh, Catherine, welcome. Um, and I am handing over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm really delighted to be here and be joining the panel today. And, and also wanted to join in congratulating um, the circle on uh, the work that they've been doing and Jessica um, in driving this, um, this proposal and gen more generally driving change and um, to really tackle labor injustice in the, in the garment sector. I think that the, the last year in particular has shown us the disproportionate impact of crises on women and other vulnerable communities and women have been really at the front lines of this pandemic, both in terms of addressing the crisis uh, in the healthcare and care sectors, for example, but also experiencing its harshest impacts. And so um, we see this particularly so in the, um, in the garment sector. Um, and I think that it just sort of resonates and, um, and strengthens the case for change and change now. Um, in terms of our, our work as a foundation, we, we do work across sort of law and journalism. And I wanted to just say as well that our editorial team has been doing a lot of reporting over the last year to amplify the human stories of the impact of the pandemic, um, including in the garment sphere. Um, and we saw, of course, a lot of brands canceling and cutting orders, delaying payments, demanding price cuts in the face of lockdowns and reduced demand. And we've seen how this was very directly passed on to workers in terms of dropping wages, lost jobs, and failure to pay severance. And uh, through journalism, you know, there's a real opportunity to, to spotlight these kinds of abuses and call them out. Um, but we also see that there, there are limitations to that. And there are, um, uh, you know, they're, they're basically, it's, it's often a, a sort of single story. Um, a, a particular brand that is called out in those kinds of stories. Um, and that's why a more uh, robust uh, regulatory approach is really, really critical. So through my work with trust law, we really see the law as, as an engine of so social change. And as was mentioned before, we were really proud to support the pro bono legal work that fed into the original fashion focus report um, that grounded the fundamental right to a living wage um, that research, of course, showed that uh, the largest garment producing countries all had legal minimum wages below um, a living wage and also uh, really laid the groundwork in terms of um, uh, outlining the downward pressure and the persistent issue of the race to the bottom that, of course, informed the proposal today. So on the proposal, I wanted to share just a few reflections. I think it is spot on in terms of identifying and tackling this, this key challenge of the race to the bottom. And so while we as an organization support many NGOs and producer countries that are advocating for stronger labor laws, their efforts are often hampered by the fact that um, there is this, uh, this disincentive to engage in, in labor law reform um, in, in, produ uh, in producer countries. Um, and of course, not unreasonably, many companies adopt the position that their obligation is to follow local law, um, that social issues are really the responsibility of governments rather than private actors and investors. And 
in the absence of legal frameworks that say otherwise, it can be really hard to, to argue that point. Um, and of course, we do see some companies going further and really stepping up in relation to the welfare of those who are most vulnerable in their supply chains. But many um, have not. And the idea increasingly is that um, human rights, environmental rights and others um, not being the role of business is, is becoming outdated. So as an organization, we're strong supporters of the mandatory human rights, uh, of mandatory human rights due diligence. And I think um, uh, clear standards more broadly, especially uh, regulatory and legal standards more broadly makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, any, any legal reform effort requires uh, diving into the details and setting, setting clear standards, um, which will lead to meaningful change on the ground. And I think that's why the specificity of the proposal that's been put forward by Circle is fantastic because it really offers clear intentionality and zeroes in on clear options for legal change in terms of um, the who, the what, and the how, and opens, and in so doing, opens up space for a really robust cross-sector dialogue around solutions. Um, and, and picking up on Martin's point, I think um, there is potentially quite an exciting opportunity to explore cross-industry um, applicability of the proposal. Um, where we see legal reform have the most meaningful and impactful change, we often see that coming as a result of collaboration and cross-dialogue um, between NGOs, grassroots advocates, uh, policymakers and governments, but also corporates and, and other stakeholders. Um, of course, this is a very complex um, issue and area, uh, but it's also not unsolvable. <laughs> um, Cross-sector uh, dialogue will not necessarily result in, um, in agreement, but we're very supportive of efforts um, to, to engage in that dialogue in order to hopefully get to a, a place and a proposal that is, um, uh, is really sort of able to uh, affect meaningful, um, meaningful change on the ground. Um, so I'm conscious of time as well, so I'll, I'll stop there, but, um, but look forward to, uh, to the discussion in the Q&A. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. Okay, so we've got lots of questions. Are we kind of happy to dive right in? <laughs> um, Jessica, I'm going to bring you in on most of these because um, most of them um, come through and ask specific questions about what is and isn't covered in the scope of the report and have you thought about X, Y, Z. And then um, for the other panellists, if you would like to um, come in, I will bring you in anyway, but if you would like to come in um, and you've got something else to add, can you use that funny little hand wavy thing or just shout at me or whatever, you know, whatever. We, we're all friends. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take this question from um, Eve Conway first. There's kind of three questions here. How can this legislation be enforced on the ground? Um, and as has been mentioned, could it just become a tick box exercise? Um, picking up on uh, Miriam's point, how do you ensure compliance? Should companies not complying be named and shamed? And is there still a risk companies will shift from one country to another? It's a meaty four point question. Jessica, um, can I come to you first? Yeah, so I suppose one has to look at this in two ways. Um, first of all, legislation creates effects, not just through enforcement, but through its existence. And we see that particularly, for example, in the area of, uh, say, competition law, where carteling now is a criminal offence and members of the board of the company can potentially go to jail, not to mention huge fines. So the existence of sanctions in themselves creates disincentive. And that's really the starting point. So I think one shouldn't always look at a proposal in terms of, well, how do we get them? Because you have to think also about how boards themselves are going to be approaching the law. Uh, and if the board is being advised that they are at risk of serious penalties and sanctions, uh, the conduct will change or will likely change without a need for any sanctions. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is that 
it shouldn't be a tick box exercise because uh, there are public uh, bodies, enforcement bodies involved that are required to or should uh, engage with the question of whether the ticking off the box um, was validly done uh, and should have you know, investigative powers uh, and powers um, to enforce. And I think in terms of named and shamed, I mean, that is that would necessarily follow in a way from enforcement, um, but is is another basis really for uh, disincentive in terms of conduct. Um, so the last point, Lucy, was is it still is there still a risk that um, there would there would be uh, that uh, producers would move from country to country? Exactly. Um, I think that that is obviously going to be uh, continue to be a risk, uh, and that's sort of fundamental in the market. Uh, but and actually, it will apply even if there's a proper living wage in each of these countries, because by virtue of different currency exchanges and different standards of living, it will necessarily be cheaper uh, for garment producing. <clears throat> companies to produce probably in Ethiopia, um, maybe would be cheaper, say, than Vietnam. I mean, there are going to always be those gradations. Uh, but the, the key point is that in each of these jurisdictions, if labor is being used in those jurisdictions, that labor should be being properly rewarded. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Miriam, you were, you were sort of mentioned in the question as well. Um, does, does, that, does that, are your questions <coughs> answered around how we ensure compliance and did you have any other um, ideas or points on that? Um, well, I, I, I agree. I want to echo uh, Jessica, she's right. I mean, I've also been speaking to some um, lawyers and law firms that are advising large companies and they have had in response to the legislative proposals that are out there and they all are saying well this is we will advise very differently from what, what how we've done before and they all feel it's a game changer just because there are the sanctions in in place and so and i think that it's the same dynamic you can also see in you know anti-corruption and bribery uh, legislation no so um i think that that already is a great incentive and then with that i think it is important to have these administrative government bodies in place because they are in, they are the ones that will you know that sort of bring this um at least the the, the risk of of uh, fines and enforcement and and then i also think it's i would more see that as i i would also more see that this come the yeah, that, that this legal framework then will hopefully drive uh, brands to be thinking about meaningful ways to ensure that living wage is paid, you know? And I think that means they will need to come up with certain ideas and solutions. And I think one of those, and then I think it would be definitely the role of civil society to show, but I think it's also quite logic, you know, what is it? It's, it is something like collective bargaining agreements. And then obviously, as you were talking now in a supply chain constellation, you have brand retailers and employers and unions. And so, so it must be a different setup as what we traditionally know as a collective bargaining agreement, no? Which is only level. So, but I, I would hope that this is, will be incentivized because I think that really is then the way to actually enforce wages. I mean, at least how we classically know it also in the national context, how do wages improve? It's through collective agreements, no? Yes, indeed. Um, Livia and um, Thulsi, I just wanted to ask you, maybe Livia first. So I, I was struck by what Jessica said then when she said, it, we shouldn't always think about how do we get them? <laughs> and I think, you know, if I might speak for all of us as a collective, when you've done lots of campaigning on this, trust with the brands and retailers is, how can I put this, often low. Um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel about, in a sense, like giving up that baggage and just, uh, just using this, these very strict kind of logical parameters to drive them? Livia. Well, I feel hugely excited about this uh, proposal uh, for a, for an actual legislation because, you know, 
as we said it already, you said it, Lucy, we, we've been campaigning for so long, hearing brands discussing for as a matter of years, you know, like more than a hundred years, I'm only 51. So probably I've heard them for only 20 years of my working life talking about, we want to, we are committed to, but it's difficult. And how do you calculate it? What do you do? How do you do it? So the law, if there is a law, will put an end to all of this. And as one of the, I remember with the first report that the lawyers launched in 2017, we worked for a year with, you know, lots of brands that came to the table secretly talking to the lawyers because they felt in a safe environment discussing their practices so that the lawyers could work and understand properly how a supply chain even works. And one of them from a very, very big retailer, one day said, well, if there is a law, there is a law, we have to comply, right? It's not about how do we comply, is we will have to and magically we will find a way. So this is why this is exciting today and this is why we make history because if a law gets passed, if there is a legislation, we don't care how they are going to comply, but I can tell you they will find a way to comply for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thulsi, can I just get your, your, um, your view on that? Unsurprisingly, I agree with Livia. I mean, from, from our perspective, the, the, the big problem is that everything has been voluntary and in the absence of regulation or, or binding regulation, you know, you're, you're left in, in a situation where brands can just say something and then do something else and there is no method or pathway for accountability. Regulating is, an, is a normal thing to do in response to a problem and it's astounding that it's actually taken this long, which is why it's so fantastic that now concrete steps are being taken. Like Livia says, the conversations that I've had with brands, if there is a law, they have no choice but to abide by that law. And I think that this is why this is why it's really important. And, and it's finally a step away from, from having to, to listen to goodwill um, and, and voluntary standards. Yeah, we've all had our fill of that. Huh? Thank you very much. OK, there's a really interesting point here, I think, um, from Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um, some groups, um, IDH, etc., recognise the importance of strong living wage commitments as an important starting point for progressing on the living wage. Would you welcome an initiative like net zero commitment, but for living wages? So, i.e. making the recent Unilever approach the norm rather than the exception. Is that an interesting idea? Martin, do you think that's an interesting idea? Well, I think it may be a very good suggestion because of course in, in terms of, well, indeed the, the existence of a law may be, may be very important. And I think it has its effects as such, also especially on the lawyers huh, because other people within companies are starting to deal with these issues than they did before because, well, if it's only voluntary, I often see, well, the, the kind of CSR departments, risk management, but not so much legal. And I think when it becomes a law, of course, legal gets involved. So it gets new attention within different parts of the company. But then, of course, it would be very important how to exactly fill in these legal norms and how do we get impact on the ground? And I think there, uh, it, it may be important to also look at best practices, which are developed by business, for example, in these kind of collaborative frameworks, where they, for example, start a collaborative buying uh, exercise, uh, because often, well, buyers or when they procure garments, well, they procure like 5% or so from a, a specific production location. So paying living wage for the 5% of these garments will not kind of guarantee a living wage for all the workers in, in the factory. So you lead collaborative buy, buying exercises, you need other types of best practices, I think, to really get that impact on the ground. So I think these collaborative approaches and, and kind of multi-stakeholder initiatives still play an important role, even if the law exists. And it may be that, that even a public um, um, supervisor or the government itself can kind of well, um, emphasize that that kind of participation in these kinds of frameworks is, is very important or even use it in, in, in public supervision saying, well, if you are a member of such a multi-stakeholder initiative, that kind of 
well, um, at least raises the presumption that you're kind of doing sufficient due diligence. So I think that all these kind of voluntary um, uh, kind of initiatives still play a role uh, next to the law. But of course, I think the law will emphasize that, that you need to do something and to, to kind of participate in these, these, these kind of frameworks. Because what we often see, of course, existence of a law has influence on, on legal and, and what companies do, but still you see that some companies are kind of are hiring lawyers to see how they can really implement a law, and some hire lawyers to say, well, what's the bare minimum? Huh? And so, of course, something happens, but, but it's kind of differently different what happens within the companies, because some do a lot, and some do, well, kind of the minimum. So I think these best practices can also show, well, this is the kind of thing you can do. Uh, and then the companies who are at the bare minimum can still say, and then public supervisors can start talking to them, well, we see better best practices in the market. So why don't you kind of implement those? So in short, I think these, in, these initiatives will uh, be important, even if the law would exist. Okay, thank you. That was a very comprehensive answer, but I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything. Um, or would we all be in violent disagreement? So should we take another, <laughs> should we take another question? Okay, there's a really interesting one here. A challenge from Martin, thank you. A challenge I can see is the risk that the commission be accused of neo-colonialism. Can the panel discuss how this might be avoided? Shall I start Lucy on that? Yes, please. Yeah. So when we started looking at this, I don't if, know if you remember, Lucy, I think you and I had a chat about um, the abolition of slavery way back and how, you know, the famous story of the British abolishing slavery, of course, happened when the, the map was pink. Um, so if you are a colonial power and you, you rule the waves and most of the world, that you can decide the law for other countries. And obviously we're not in that position now, we're in a position where you can only decide the law for your own jurisdiction. Um, and in our jurisdiction, this kind of behavior is criminal. If you employ workers in Britain, which we know has happened in these kind of exploitative ways, you go to jail or you should go to jail. Um, there is law that governs that. But what do you do in a globalized world where you can effectively uh, do something that would be criminal in your own country by uh, doing it in another country? And that's effectively what companies are doing um, because it's lawful in, in Bangladesh to pay uh, poverty wages um, and to treat uh, people exploitatively. So there is obviously a huge problem and I understand the argument, well, the commission can't go about fixing wages for Bangladesh, and obviously it can't. So the whole approach that this, this proposal uh, takes is to attempt not to enforce any kind of rules on other countries, but to enforce rules on companies that conduct business within the EU jurisdiction which should create a market incentive or get rid of the disincentive um, to enable those countries to raise their minimum wages without negatively affecting their uh, labor and job position. It's difficult, it's uncomfortable, but it's essentially the commission not saying this should be your wage, but saying with the ILO, looking at your economy, if wages fall below this point, then that is a, a wage risk point. Um, and, and we make that comment. It is all only a comment, effectively. It doesn't enforce any country to do anything. It's a comment. I hope that sort of answers it. Yeah, I think it's a good answer. And um, I just wanted to ask you about the ILO because I wondered a few times as I was reading through the report. Um, has, have you developed this with the ILO or are you um this is within their mandate the, the margins of their of where they act so this is automatically 
um, what they would do in this process? So uh, what we decided in relation to setting a living wage is that we, we noticed that over the last 20 years, there'd been thousands of reports and debates about what a living wage was, and that that was really where the focus of the energy was. Um, and there are various mechanisms out there. Obviously, it is within the remit of the ILO to consider these kind of things because they fall under, you know, ILO recommendations, etc. But it seemed to us that ultimately it would be for the Commission to decide how to fix this wage risk point for each country, but that it might well choose to work with the ILO to work out the formula that it was going to use. So that's a sort of square bracket question mark within the proposal. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned Bangladesh, and I'm wondering, this might be with well um, outside my technical um, abilities, but if we could bring Kalpona in, because I think she's here. Um, and I wonder if she could um, just um, give us her response to the report and what she's heard so far. Kalpona, are you able to speak to us? No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so amazing. Always amazing to see you, but even more amazing right now. Yeah, it is. It is wonderful to you know. Hi. Uh, wonderful to you know listening everyone, and I was like overwhelming. Um, <clears throat> the living way is one of the issue that we are being fighting or talking for many years. Um, as I'm one of the, you know, steering board member in the CCC, so we are being also uh, talking how we can get the branch to sign on this legally binding agreement. Yes, in my country, the paying poor wages is a law, like minimum wage. The minimum wage is not enough for one worker's full month cost, let alone, you know, if she has two children or she has a family, and it's a law. So I'm just listening about the, you know, uh, what you have in, in this report and, you know, uh, I'm apologize for my ignorance because I didn't read whole report. I didn't get chance to, and there is so technical details, which I need to absorb in coming days. But what I, you know, few comments I wanted to make, not in the report, but in general that the people need a decent ways to understand that you don't need to read a rocket science is normal. Like a brand who comes from Denmark, in their country, they are paying living wages to the store worker. And why they don't understand that workers, those are producing clothes for them, are producing sportswear for them, need a living wage. I always welcome a law, but you know, when we think about a country where we are in, even we have a law, a pretty good law in many cases, but law are not enforcing here. What do we need if sourcing country do have a law that has to be enforced and the brands need to be abide by that. The brands need to add with the garments they are sourcing. Otherwise, the living wage will be not possible for the production country. The manufacturers at this moment, I mean, always there, they're saying that they don't make, make profit out of it, which is absolutely uh, um, not truth, but they don't make that much that they can ensure a living wage for our workers. Like for a, a normal calculation, a living wage for Bangladeshi worker, we need the four times than the wage we have as minimum. The minimum wage is $95 a month we just mean we need almost $400 a month. And then the government need to ensure that cost of living is not getting higher. If that goes up, then whatever living voice we would have, that will be not helping. So yeah, I wanted to uh, you know stop here commenting this. Um, the law is great. The enforcement is really, really important. And then brand need to be binding with that. That is more important. Kalpana, thank you so much. Miriam, I know you want to come in. 
Yes, only only one small comment on on this question of is is that colonialism? I mean, I mean, I think the question is um, is not our economic system and supply chains basically built on neo-colonialism isn't isn't that already in itself because uh what what and and what we also shouldn't forget is that supply chains are organized through law right so i think we are using the law to have access to cheap labor to lit markets but to make sure that there are no responsibilities coming back you know and therefore so it's you know it's it's the whole supply idea of supply chains externalizing costs economic risks and you do this by law by also externalizing any obligations you have on labor rights no so i would say that in itself is already colonial um and then the question is as you can we just heard from kalpona obviously in bangladesh people also believe there should be a living wage paid so you know, assuming that we now think about how we want to make our companies pay a fair wage so, and therefore sort of giving more ability for Bangladeshi workers to claim their rights, I, you know, I find that a bit difficult to see the colonial aspect in this dynamic. While, because we're not wanting to implement law in Bangladesh, right? So we're, we're just trying to uh, regulate actors that are located in the EU and making most of the profit in the EU. Okay, thank you. Martin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's kind of um, tapping in on, on the point Miriam just made in terms of, well, the, the kind of way we manage supply chains is also a legal thing, especially a contractual uh, thing, I, I, I would say. Um, and of course, I think many Western uh, brands should also kind of consider how their contractual uh, kind of frameworks kind of uh, hamper uh, enjoying a living wage in, in, in countries like Bangladesh because there are often kind of uh, clauses in there where the kind of responsibility for all this is kind of shifted to the suppliers whereas well, the kind of companies forget their own responsibility in this whole thing. So I think supply chain management, contractual supply chain management should not be pushing down kind of responsibility in the supply chain, but should be a dialogue between suppliers and, and buyers in terms of how are we going to manage this issue. And I think there the contractual frameworks also really need to be changed. And well, to give an example of, of how that can be done, the American Bar Association has not just published some model clauses on this, where there is also a Schedule P, which kind of well, includes some kind of um, well, responsible buying clauses where indeed is this kind of dialogue and also responsibility for access to remedy is kind of included. And I think that that are also very important part of this kind of change we need and, and which I hope this kind of law will also bring about. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine, we haven't heard from you for a while. I just would like to get, um, well, anything that you want to comment on so far. And then after that, we've got lots of technical questions. So I think we'll do a quick fire round with Jessica. And then the panelists, if you want, if you just put your hands up, if you want to chime in. But Catherine, let's come to you for a minute. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I was, I was listening and, and nodding along and agreeing with them, um, with many of the comments that were made. I think, um, I think one thing that really, um, resonates with me is that um, we as, as an organization, as a pro bono um, network, work all around the world. And we're working with lots of organizations and advocates who are trying to make change in, in, in the sort of producer, you know, garment producer countries um, uh, around the world. And I think that um, this, this point around um, actually engaging in dialogue, making sure that we're able to um, um, to hear hear those voices, and making sure that we are um, we're supporting their their advocacy efforts through through the the regulations and the um, and the proposals that are being put forward in in Europe. Um, if uh, I I, th I think that's really important, and I think that um, it is something that. There's a lot of there's a lot of appetite for, and I think um, Calpona really highlighted that that there is um, a, it can be challenging to make to make change in in a producer country when um, when there's that existing sort of downward pressure and um, uh, and and sort of challenges to be faced um, 
by by governments in terms of navigating how they interact with brands and and whether they potentially lose um, uh, lose that um, that income for their countries. So so I think that that's that's really critical. Um, and I'll I'll stop there and, um, <laughs> and turn it over to you and um, and um, and hear more from Jessica on the proposal. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so like I say, if anyone's got anything to add, please just jump in. But um, Jessica, I'm going to take this question from Marius first. If I understand correctly, this is a proposal for EU legislation. Where does the UK come into this? And then a second thing, what happens for brands importers from other non-EU countries that might have considerable le uh, leverage with the manufacturing countries? I know you fought quite hard for us to not be outside of the EU, but um, yeah, we are where we are. So I, I'm going to ask you again about the second question again, because I didn't quite understand it. But the, the, the first question. Um, so the UK, of course, is now free to make its own trade agreements. Um, and therefore, it's up to the UK to make free trade agreements that include human rights clauses, which it can do, uh, which can go beyond this proposal. Um, and uh, let's hope that that's what happens. Um, I mean, you, you may remember the repeated statements that Brexit would mean um, cheap clothing, footwear, and um, food from, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, that was his, his line, um, but it was the line of a lot of Brexiters. So uh, one of the objectives uh, of those people was to uh, actually cheapen imports, which doesn't bode very well for increasing costs of production. Nevertheless, there is an opportunity in UK trade agreements to have specific human rights clauses. Um, why did we choose the EU? Uh, because simply the EU is an enormous market. It's um, the biggest market in the world, at least it was before the UK left. It's certainly uh, up there with the United States um, in terms of the size of its market. Therefore, its regulation has global effects. Um, and a regu the regulation, of course, covers the external customs border of the EU. So it would effectively deal, cover a market of around 450 million people. Um, and therefore it's the obvious place really to start. And it's quite possible if, if the UK doesn't adopt um, provisions in trade agreements that this in any event would impact on the UK and also would impact on the US because US regulation also um, often falls into line with EU regulation. The second question, Lucy, sorry, I didn't quite well, understand it. Well, as I understand it, so there's, there's countries that have considerable leverage with manufacturing countries, presumably because of the volume of orders that they put through. So it's, the UK is kind of in that. Um, so I suppose what Marit is saying, what, what's, how can we bring these, these brands and importers yeah. um, from those countries also into, into some sort of mechanism because presumably they could just go on shirking living wage indefinitely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, there, are, there are brands, um, it's interesting that the OECD guidance actually suggests that brands should use their leverage on governments somehow to increase wages. Um, but I mean, I, insofar as anybody is selling in the EU, they, they would be caught. I think, that's, I think that's the answer, unless I still haven't quite understood the point. Okay, well, we'll leave it there, but if Marius, if you want to um, um, just uh, tell us if we're not rabbit, if we're not understanding it, <laughs> you can tell us in the chat. Um, so let me see, could you speak further about the collective bargaining elements? How would this be understood in the context of China where in reality there's just one union and this has been criticized as not genuinely serving Chinese workers? Would an importer have to demonstrate that they've done um, what they could in this context, e.g. E check that management and worker communication are effective? 
So uh, I suppose I should start by saying there's no way that this proposal contains all the answers. Uh, and in fact, I would really appreciate, I think we'd all really appreciate if um, anyone and everyone who, who's participating in this, if you have any suggestions to improve the proposal, um, you, you do send them to, to one of us. Um, there is a problem with all due diligence legislation. It's something that I really struggled with, which is that if the position is really bad and you've done your due diligence, and you say, well, the position's really bad in that country. What actually are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to not use that country? In which case, do you negatively affect that country's economy? Um, I think there's no, there's no real answer to this. Undoubtedly, China would be on this annex. China, importers from China would be bound by this regulation but they wouldn't have the power to actually ensure collective bargaining. Um, so they'd have to do their due diligence, but they couldn't actually ensure that collective bargaining was provided. And that would be the same under any EU due diligence um, legislation. And that's really a, you know, an eternal problem. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is to that problem. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. Martin or Miriam, do you have any? Yeah, Miriam? Yeah, I mean, I think we do have to admit that the concept of due diligence simply has its limits. And I think if you come to situations uh, like, like China, um, I think it's simply, I don't think companies will go any further. And we know they did, there's, they can't, well, human, you can't try to do your due diligence. The, they will face that they have no leverage and then there's not more you can do. I think if we want to tackle those questions, there must be different answers to it, which doesn't mean that nevertheless, it's a, like it's a, the best, I would say at the moment, one of the best concepts we have no? to regulate obligations of companies. Okay, thank you, Martin. No, I think just to add to that, I think of course, and, and also in, in terms of collective bargaining, the law cannot change the world at, at once. So I think that's also not to be expected from companies either in terms of due diligence. But that does not say that you cannot take smaller steps uh, to do to try to reach at least a certain level uh, where workers have some influence, which is not the collective bargaining as we see it. But I think you can kind of incremental steps. Uh, to, to change and, and improve things without having a, a real collective bargaining. So I think the answer on the collective bargaining issue uh, being, well, in China it's not possible, so I don't have to do anything. I think that would be too easy. So I think the law would also kind of emphasize that you need to exercise leverage. You have to think also in collaboration, maybe with other companies, how to kind of improve the situation and maybe step by step, not having real collaboration collective bargaining already in place, but still doing something. Now, so I think the answer, well, collective bargaining is not possible in China, so that's it. I think that, that would be too easy. Okay, thank you. Um, Joss uh, Huber just makes the point on the chat that concerning China, companies can still make an effort to pay prices to allow producers to pay living wages and to discuss this with producers. Um, Sharon McLennigan, who's organized this whole thing. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, just uh, says, if anyone's got comments on the report, could you please send them to livingwage at thecircle.ngo, livingwage at thecircle.ngo. There are some kind of amazing discussions sort of uh, uh, mushrooming in the chat and the Q and A, <laughs> as well as resources and loads more questions. So I'm gonna try and harvest them but um, uh, we will work out like where to put them and how we can kind of respond, um, respond to them as well. Um, I'm gonna um, stop the questions there because there are so many great ones. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, uh, and um, I want to kind of finish on time because we've done so well. <laughs> so now I'm gonna hand over to the woman who we wouldn't just wouldn't be here having this discussion without her because Melanie Hall QC set up the lawyers circle. Um, she also closed the show really brilliantly when we did a living wage symposium. So we wondered if she could do it again. So here she is <laughs> this morning, over to you, Melanie Hall.
you're on yeah thank you so much lucy thank you yes it falls to me to give a a synopsis of a, a fascinating insightful focused informative panel session and the q and a's are absolutely fantastic and the number of themes that have emerged um which i've noted and and the first and foremost is that of collaboration and that notion of collaboration kicks in at so many levels as livia opened the session with this whole endeavor started with a collaboration between Trust Law, Thomson Reuters, King Close Campaign, The Circle. We built upon Lucy's collaboration with Neil Carney and, and Doug Miller. Um, and this collaborative, the, the collaborative nature of the endeavor is something which we, I think, must all not lose sight of. So as Miriam quite rightly said, that the proposal in some respects complements existing um, human rights and environmental due diligence obligations that are already floating around and that notion of complementarity through collaboration can be incredibly um, impactful. Businesses must work with the legislature, with the executive, that's also collaborative. As Martin pointed out, you need to look at local complaint mechanisms. As Miriam pointed out, you have to look at worker-driven initiatives as well as top-down initiatives coming down from the government. And in some respects, the need to focus on collaborating together at so many different levels derives from the fact that, as Jessica said, the problem is essentially structural. It's driven by market forces. Every single speaker talked about this. Um, so Tulsi, there's a structural imbalance of power baked into the business model. Miriam, you talked about the need for systematic change Catherine, you talked about the need for this being a, a business initiative, not just a government initiative. And I think that the relationship between the need to collaborate and the structural nature of the problem sort of complements each other. And I was particularly taken by Kalpona's input because no voice is more eloquent or impactful than the voice of those who've experienced the problem under discussion. And I was so privileged and honored to speak to you, Kalpona, and thank you for taking the time to do so. Because as you so rightly pointed out, the absence of a living wage does have a ripple effect. You talked about the inability to save, to provide effective childcare, to educate yourself. And that's because a fundamental human right to a living wage is a fundamental feature of any dignified life. And as Martin pointed out, the living wage is an enabler for tackling so many other human rights. It's fundamental. As Catherine pointed out, it has a disproportionate impact on women, as indeed has COVID, as Kalpona also pointed out, and you all spoke about, because crises, as we all know, reveal the most vulnerable in our society. And that's what COVID has done. And the impact that COVID has had, which Kalpona talked about so eloquently on the women working in Bangladesh, speaks for itself. So I'm very grateful, grateful for that input. I think that um, the, the, next, the next big question that we've been grappling with is that of enforcement, which has been identified as one of the biggest challenges. I think everyone has acknowledged that the legislation doesn't provide all of the answers, that due diligence has its limitations, that there are obligations that cascade down from the legislation that are owed by the sector. And let's not forget the consumers. I think that's one input that perhaps I would have made if I'd been a speaking panelist, which is that and this feeds back to my collaboration theme, collaborative relation between big government, business and consumers, because I know that in my household, I have relatively young daughters who are very mindful consumers. There are certain shops from which they will not buy their clothes because they regard them as iniquitous retail outlets and they have embargoed them. And that is true of many of their friendship groups. So I regard the younger generation as being part of the solution to the problem. They are the future and they are far more engaged with the issues than we were when we were their age. With Apologies to those who are young. I can see how you know, I'm 61, so I'm one of the one of the old people. So I think that that piece around collaboration and everyone working together in the same place will help everyone. And I think that's the theme that I very much picked up. 
I think that the, the challenge of enforcement and verification is one which will always be there. It's, it's a challenge that is inherent in any piece of regulation, any legislation, any law. That's why you have lawyers, people disobey the law. So I don't think that the, the existence of the challenge of enforcement should be an inhibitor. And I think that's also been a theme. Every speaker, every questioner has acknowledged that enforcement is a problem to which I kind of say, yeah, but it's not unique to the garment sector. It's not unique to the circles proposal for regulatory change. So I think that for my part, having heard all of the speakers talk about that challenge, I would urge everyone not to categorize it as an inhibitor, but to recognize it as a universal problem with all legislation and therefore not necessarily put it in a box, but nod at it, but not let it drag you back. So as ever, and has happened at the last symposium, there's been a number of themes and it's very, I find it very interesting just stepping back and listening to everyone because these themes bubble up and we all need to listen to that. It's not that everyone is saying the same thing because one of the benefits of these symposiums is that everyone has a slightly different take on the same problem and that's why a collaborative effort such as this, where we can all learn from each other and expand the base of our knowledge and wisdom, that better enables us to be effective advocates. So I'm really, really grateful for all of those who've organized this incredible event, all the speakers. I'm up, up to my five minutes, I've got to stop now. Lucy, I'm gonna hand over to you because I know you're gonna shut this whole thing down quite quickly. Um, we're almost on time, but um, it's been absolutely terrific. And thank you very much indeed, thank you. Oh, Melanie, thank you so much. I could listen to you all day, but I know you don't have all day. Um, well, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming. I have harvested all the questions in the chat. And um, uh, just to reiterate, as Sharon says, livingwage at the circle.ngo. We would love your feedback to the report and um, to make any comments. That would be really super helpful to us. Um, just very quickly, Livia and I, um, just, just to speak to uh, Melanie's point about engaging consumers and talking to, you know, talking to people about how they view the, the report we are um we're doing a short movie and um, we're doing all sorts of things where we're really looking at the opportunity that this report uh, gives us and socializing and humanizing the stuff that we're talking about to um really keep that um activism movement going because it, i think it, i think melanie's right i think it is growing um so um please if you can help us get in touch uh we'd love to hear from you um and thank you to all our panelists thank you to Sharon for organising and Zoe at Matrix Chambers as well um, and for everyone for being involved. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>